Honorable Order, I am Hindul Sen Gupta. I invited Ambassador Pinaki Ranjan Chakraborty to talk to me today, the Ambassador and also former Secretary of the Ministry of External Affairs in India, is somebody who understands one fundamental thing, foreign perception of India's democratic values and democracy. I invited the ambassador to talk to me today because this is a particularly pertinent moment to talk about the nature and quality of India's democracy. A lot of concerns were highlighted across foreign media, think tanks and other platforms in the last one or two years across the Western world, especially uh, including the you know, Anglo-Saxon world, Scandinavia, uh, you know, in America, North America and so on and so forth about whether Indian democracy is, in a sense, in crisis. India just had an election, a national election, with more than 640 million people voting. Uh, it threw up results that were very interesting, complex, which are still being studied. I wanted the ambassador to try and talk to us a little bit about how this election and its results, in a sense, completely contradict all that was said about the quality of Indian elections. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you. I want to begin by asking you, why do you think, we'll come to the exact election and what happened there in just a moment, but why do you think such concerns, you know, in a sense, rose to a crescendo almost in the last two or three years as India came closer and closer to the 2024 national elections, especially across the Western world? Well, it's not far, uh, I mean, it's not rocket science. Uh, and we all know that the narratives that the Western media built was uh, motivated. It was encouraged by certain Western interests, perhaps certain governments and their intelligence agencies, also outside governments, people who want India, who want India to be what they want India to be, you know, that kind of. And so, but it doesn't work, you know, because uh, after all, apart from you, me, and those English speaking crowd, which reads the Western media, you think an Indian voter in, in a village in India actually reads the Western media? I doubt it. Right? So the Indian voter is hardly influenced by it, although they feel in the West that they are creating this narrative to influence the it does influence some people, of course, and, uh, and they have their echo chamber who, who, who echo a similar sentiments. There are people abroad uh, who, are, uh, who are part of that, uh, you know, who are paid perhaps to write all these things. So I think uh, we have to live with it after all. If you, if you uh, they of course talk about a free press, but when motivated reports are planted and that's not really free press in my view. There, uh, some of it may be free, written voluntarily, but even when it is encouraged and paid for, uh, then it's certainly not a free press. As I said, uh, it, it, in my view, the individual voter in India, the large majority, is not influenced by the, uh, by this kind of narrative. There are other more important issues that the Indian voter takes. Some people ask the question that uh, apart from being directed towards perhaps the Indian voter, um, and as you correctly point out, many people, especially in rural areas, don't really care about what the Economist or the New York Times is saying about India. But this is also done to create a particular image of India, rising India around the world. Uh, you know, some people there even feel that perhaps these things are done to, in effect, you know, India is no longer in a situation where gunboats can be sent to, you know, for a regime change. But this is, in a sense, uh, you know, soft efforts to nudge towards regime change. How do you respond to such fears? As I say, these narratives are there. They would like, uh, you know, India to behave in a particular manner or uh, and they would hence want... Uh, a leadership in India, which is more amenable, more pliable to their demands. But as I said, these narratives don't affect the, the ordinary voter in India, because that ordinary voter votes on local issues, votes on economic issues, votes on various other social issues, votes on uh, 
you know, uh, whether uh, whether he's getting enough water for his fields. There are so many issues in India. It's a large country, developing economy, and the economy is doing fairly well at the moment. So I don't think, although these narratives do reflect a certain sort of attitude and a certain desire, if I may say so, that um, India should be different than what it is, uh, which which fits in with their kind of uh, what India should be. And of course, that it does send out an image because they are, these Western media channels are global and people watch it. Uh, but those who understand India, those who study India, uh, accept I mean, there are ivory towers, academicians living in various, various places who, of course, opine that you know, democracy is in decline. I think this is a uh, this has been proven that by this election that democracy is certainly not in decline. And uh, no other country in the world has this, this vast numbers of people voting. And the can you imagine the organization that goes into uh, this the structure, the electoral structure that is put in place for the voting. Uh, it is beyond imagination for those sitting in the West. I also want to talk a little bit about while it doesn't influence, of course, locally. Um, in the international sphere, do you think it, in, it, it impacts, for instance, investments, you know, at an age where ESG is becoming more and more important, at an age where people talk more and more about social and governance issues. Uh, do you think it's targeted to impact things like that? Well, it may have a marginal effect, but I would say those who bring in FDI uh, into India for manufacturing or uh, whatever it is, they are driven by their, uh, their economic interests. And if they see a country that is growing, the large population, the world's largest population, huge consumer market, and growing at, uh, I think the last quarter figures were very encouraging, uh, eight plus percent of GDP growth, uh, they would want to be part of this uh, growth story. So while they do, do read and do get influenced, after all, sentiment is very important when you talk about the stock market or the foreign direct investment, etc. So as you can see, India's stock market rose and fell very quickly when the results started came coming out. That happens. But I doubt if, uh, if the fundamentals, uh, if the fundamentals of the economy are strong, foreign direct investors or foreign investors will not be deterred by, by these narratives in the media. Let's talk a little bit about the scale of the Indian elections and what India really showcased you know, in defiance, as it were, to the criticism that had come. Uh, you know, we had really once again the world's biggest ever election. More than 600 million people, as I was saying, essentially braved one of the hottest ever climate, uh, climatic conditions in India, across North India, Western India, Eastern India, Southern India, to, you know, cast their votes and make their electoral choice known. Uh, the, the sheer scale, perhaps you could talk a little bit about that, you know, um, on how in India, in a sense, demonstrated a scale that most people, you know, a think tank sitting in Scandinavia or a newspaper in America cannot understand. It's almost like it, it you know, this kind of scale would defy their imagination. Indeed. Yeah, the, of course, they don't know. These are small countries uh, sitting in their, uh, in their academic chambers and trying to get as much information online or whatever. But we, we, we live in India and we see. And those who live in India go around and see what's happening. They would be better informed, in my view, because uh, they actually see on the ground. You can go and talk to people go and talk to anybody on the ground, workers, uh, you know, uh, from uh, who are doing daily wages on daily wages or to farmers, etc. So I think the scale, of course, is huge, as I mentioned. The organization aspects are also very complex. And that is why we've, we've had to have elections, not on one day, like most countries in the West have, that one day and it's all over. In India, it doesn't happen like 
different days are allotted uh, for different states, etc. Because first of all, there is uh, you have to provide security, and uh, the, the census since it's the Election Commission of India, a federal kind of a body, uh, that basically has to deploy security forces which are under the command of the central government. You know, like CISF or CRP or BSF. And they usually don't allow the state government police, uh, you know, to be, uh, to be at the core of the, the voting uh, sort of room or something like that. This is a practice developed over a long time. Um, some people say that it's, it's because the state police has been, uh, you know, usually co-opted by the state governments, etc., and uh, can cause uh, difficulties for the people in when they, when they come to vote. They have some local interest or you know vested interest. So keep that uh, to to keep that uh, uh, keep that uh, thing uh, you know neutral. Uh, central forces are deployed. And as you know, we don't have unlimited central forces. So they have to be moved from state to state to set up and provide the security that is required for, for the elections. Let's talk a little bit also about the kind of people who gather to vote in an Indian election. You know, uh, elections, I mean, really every part of the country, from the smallest hamlets, I mean, there are these incredible visuals of uh, electoral agents carrying, you know, EVMs now. They used to carry those boxes to put in paper ballots, but EVMs now, even for one person, you know, who's there perhaps in a remote island or a village or in a mountain in the desert, for one one individual voter, policemen, you know, and electoral agents carry EVMs so that every vote can be cast. Uh, this again is not understood. Yes, in some remote areas, like in the hilly, hilly states, for example, or in the deserts, where there are not too many voters, let's say uh, a few voters, uh, I mean, count them in the you know, tens or fifties or thing like that. Maybe the, the the it is the the law states that the election commission has to provide the necessary facility within a particular you know distance that you don't have to uh, walk for you know you know days or you know uh, to go get to the voting uh, booth so that is a requirement of the law uh, so hence i for example voted around the corner in a school where usually schools are used uh, uh, extensively and regularly for setting up these uh, and schools are unusually holiday now, so the space is available. And uh, so it was, let, let's say, less than a kilometer for me to walk and go and uh, cast my vote. Similarly, those who are in remote areas are also should also get the same facility, uh, and uh, not just the, those in urban areas or in larger towns and cities. So hence, <clears throat> that is a requirement that has that is usually fulfilled by the election. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about EVMs. You know, that's the other thing that, you know, again, consistently becomes news. Oh, you know, India uses EVMs. Can an EVM be hacked? O over the years now, it has been proved again and again and again that an EVM cannot be tampered with. Now, just because in America, they don't use EVMs and some other Western countries, they don't use EVMs, such as the colonized mindset that we have, that those are the examples that are cited again and again. In fact, India has a process where even the EVMs can be checked through what is called VPAT, you know, paper slips, which also is conducted rigorously as it was done this time. So this is, again, a process that most people around the world don't understand. But when uh, when you go to uh, go to the booth to, to vote and you vote... Uh, there are symbols and names, of course. And then you press the button. There is a machine attached to it, which which uh, there's a paper roll there, which shows the symbol that, uh, I mean, it's linked to the EVM. And as you push the button, that symbol comes on here. So you are sure you are voting for that person and that symbol. And uh, so it is kind of foolproof in that sense. I mean, if Lots of efforts have been made, whether we can hack it remotely, etc. 
So EVM is not connected remotely, so it cannot be hacked. So I think I think that debate is over that the EVM has been hacked or it has been stuffed uh, in, in beforehand. I don't think that is uh, credible anymore. That's my view. And uh, and the strange thing about the politics here is that if somebody loses, then it's the EVM's fault. But if I win, then I don't talk about the EVM at all. I mean, you will see it happening now that the EVM will soon will disappear from the political discourse. So this we have seen time and time again. So those who understand see through this facade uh, of it's hypocritical, really, that if I win, I, then the EVM is fine. If I lose, the EVM is uh, EVM has been compromised or that. So I think this is uh, this is a bit of a you know false kind of a narrative that is built up. I don't buy it. As we wrap up the conversation, I have one last, a uh, couple of last things to ask you, Ambassador. Uh, one of them is this, you know, this again, uh, you know, before this election, there was this whole thing that India is taking a definitive turn towards, you know, some said single party states, some cried authoritarian and so on and so forth. The Indian election in 2024 has given us an extremely mixed result. I mean, some would say funnily mixed because the parties that have lost are claiming to have won and the party that has won is unhappy that it hasn't won enough. So, you know, it's funny, but that's in the Indian context. But for the global audience, it's a very mixed result. I mean, there is no sign in any shape or form that there is, you know, move towards any autocratic direction at all. Once again, those fears have entirely been proved wrong. What kind of tight flying is, what can I say? I don't want to use a strong word, but uh, it's, uh, but I, I must actually. <laughs> it's utter rubbish. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, there is a motivated uh, sort of discourse and narrative that tends to promote this kind of thing. Uh, some of it, I don't know whether it comes from certain, uh, you know, a superiority complex uh, uh, of the Anglo-Saxon world uh, or others that uh, think that. Uh, and, but, and if you note carefully, these are all former colonial powers, most of them. And uh, some are not, of course. Uh, some are the do-gooders, you know, who think that they know best. And since they run their country very efficiently and properly, democratically, and hence uh, the norms, etc., that they think uh, should be valid globally, should be applied to India. And, and therefore, India has to be found uh, not up to the mark. So that happens. You know, there are so many of these uh, Western uh, institutions which come out with these indices. You know, some of them are okay. They are, we can we can argue about it, but some some doesn't seem at all uh, you know credible. When India is put below Pakistan, below Afghanistan uh, uh, in terms of democracy, I mean one can only laugh at these kind of uh, you know you know indices or you know hierarchies that. That are put out. So I don't think. I think we are we are on safe ground. Our democracy is very very strong, despite what anybody wants to say abroad. They are free to say what they. But I think people of India have grown out of that kind of criticism narratives that are built in the West. We understand that and we see through them, and we are quite confident now that that's not going to affect our uh, our political discourse or. They will, of course, keep trying to do it, but that's that's the nature of the politics and international thing. You know, uh, a friendly, pliable government uh, uh, in India would be nice. Like we might think a friendly, pliable government in some other country. You know, let's say in uh, in some uh, place near near India uh, would be good for us. Those thinking are there in geopolitics, and uh, that's not going to go away. But we know that, uh, we understand that, we see through all these games. Everybody knows that. And, uh, those, who us, those of us who have been in government and, and watched all these uh, uh, things closely and read reports, you know, intelligence reports about such activities, we understand. 
But I dare say that not many people do not understand. They, they either jump onto the bandwagon because they are ideologically not uh, opposed to the government or some ideological con the conflict is there. So they, so they band together with these critics from the West and, and uh, go on publishing this narrative. Now, I don't know what the new narrative is going to be, but uh, uh, let us see. Wait and see. My final question then, Ambassador, how long do you think this will continue? India's now, you know, there was a time when Indians recognized that we were poor, you know, we were not very strong. We had many other issues. India is today the fifth largest, you know, uh, economy in the world. Uh, by all assessment, it might become the third largest by 2027, 28. Um, it, it's growing, you know, the latest numbers show that it's growing at more than 8% a year. Um, you know, India is the single largest democratic market in the world today with 1.4 billion people. How long do you think these efforts will continue? And what should India do to respond at all uh, to, you know, malicious, often malicious efforts like these? Well, I think it's now part of the, uh, what should I say, the international order. Even if you are a big country, pressures can be brought. Now, ultimately, you know, we have lived through a period of American hegemony, or you can say Western, but mainly American hegemony, which is now being challenged. China is challenging it as India becomes the third largest economy in India. India has also already challenged it to some extent because India uh, has a long history of taking very independent decisions, uh, which comes down from the days of non-alignment. But today we call it strategic autonomy, or that we will decide on the basis not of what the West wants or the East wants or whoever wants. These kind of things are going to matter less and less in the sense that uh, as, as our comprehensive national power grows, and it will yes. grow inevitably. And uh, so I think this will matter less and less, but it will continue. I'm quite sure that this will continue because... There is a world out there who think that they can influence and they have the uh, power, etc., or or use their leverage in whatever form they can to do these things. So I think uh, uh, it's par for the course in that sense. And perhaps we should build our own tools to counter it, uh, Ambassador. Sometimes I feel whether we should do it or not, because uh, that would be investing, uh, you know, the sources in a in an effort. I mean, uh, let's take any example. For example, I think we should leave it to our media, and I don't think the government of India is interested in that uh, uh, that kind of effort or to push a state effort towards that kind of narrative. There are enough people in India who write who can always give a counter narrative, etc. We have a free press, a free media, so I don't think uh, that is necessary for us to. You know, like getting somebody to write uh, in favor of uh, something uh, in the whatever. I don't want to name those uh, those uh, those newspapers and other things, but we all know what whom we are talking about. So I don't think that's a worthwhile effort at all because they they are not going to change. Their their attitudes uh, will only change maybe later, but that's that's for them to change, and we can only ensure that we grow strong. And we grow domestically and we become more and more powerful, then automatic changes will happen in these narratives. Wonderful. On a note of uh, growing our comprehensive national power, uh, thank you very much, Ambassador, for sparing time to talk to us. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.